I want to welcome everybody to the first Friday, which is the day that we do our webinar where you get to ask questions. So I encourage you to ask any question. It doesn't have to be on the topic I'm presenting today. I'm Debbie McCray. I'm a licensed counselor out of Arizona where I have my own private practice specializing in treating sex addicts, porn addicts, trade partners, and couples who are trying to repair their relationships as part of that process of recovery. Um, there is a word that shows up frequently in my office, in fact, almost on a daily basis. So today's webinar is on that word, and the word is gaslighting. And it is a it's a topic that kind of at, of itself, it kind of connotates something really bad. So today we're going to talk about it, understand its purpose, what it might sound like, and what you can do about it. So why do sex and porn addicts gaslight? And how can their betrayed partners recognize it? So that's the topic for today. So briefly, the definition of a gaslighting. I'm gonna give you one that sounds very clinical and then I'm gonna give you one that's very simple. So the clinical one is that it's a behavior that is a form of psychological abuse where false, deceitful, or manipulative information is presented by the addict partner. Simple one is it's a communication technique in which the addict partner causes the betrayed partner to question their own version of events, both past and present, their reality and who they are. So the addict partner is so good at times at presenting things as their truth and that's the ultimate truth. What happens is this victimizes the betrayed partner and they begin to doubt their feelings, their judgment, their reality and even their sanity. So let's talk a little bit about gaslighting is. <clears throat> I found some different things that I thought gaslighting is and one of them is gaslighting is a power trip. People gaslight because it gives them power. Gaslighting is something that we oftentimes don't recognize as happening because it's so slow. It's that slow boil, I call it. You're living with it. It happens. You don't recognize it. However, gaslighting keeps the betrayed partner constantly on their toes and on high alert. So this gives a dynamic of the addict partner having more power and control. So here's the classic pattern of what this dynamic looks like. First of all, the, the addict partner might say something mean, nasty, cruel, hurtful to the betrayed partner, or they refuse to show up or tell the complete truth. So then the betrayed partner comes in to defend him or herself, and they make an attempt to get the addict partner to truly understand what they're dealing with only to have the addict partner immediately put them down, criticize them and turn it back on them and all sorts of other behaviors where they end up feeling stupid, useless, crazy, ridiculous and wrong. So if you've got a dynamic that sounds similar to that, there may be gaslighting involved. Gaslighting is a great way to hide addiction. <clears throat> so we know that the trade partner is in a relationship with a spouse that struggles with pornography and with sex behaviors that they are certainly going to deal with gaslighting at some point. So just know that it's going to be part of the relationship. So that's why it's important that you recognize it and know what to do with it. So the addict partner uses this tactic to hide the truth about the hidden betrayal, the hidden behaviors, the secret behaviors that they've gone into that are promiscuous, that if their partner knew about it, their partner would not want to even connect with them. And so it's a great way to not have to face the addiction. It's a way of manipulating loved ones into going along with the addiction at times. So if I gaslight and I tell you what you want to hear, then you'll think I'm in recovery and I can still stay in my addiction because you believe what I say, even though your intuition might be telling you differently. Um, and I want to really stress this. This is very important that gaslighting is really difficult for the betrayed partner to identify. When you are in it, it is so hard to know what's happening. Oftentimes, I will hear betrayed partners say things like, every time I have a conversation with him, I feel like I'm going crazy. Right? Every time we have a conversation, I feel like I'm the one that gets blamed and I'm the one that's got more of a problem than they do. So just tune in and notice when you're communicating with your addict partner, 
Just notice how you feel. Notice the dynamics and be aware of that. Gaslighting serves a great purpose for the addict partner. So we're going to talk about seven of those, how it helps them. First of all, we talked a little bit about this, and it helps them to preserve their addiction. So you know what? If they acknowledge the seriousness of their addiction, that means that they would have to do something about it. So they want to gaslight so that others aren't aware, so then they don't have to face the consequences of their addiction, and also that they have to step in and do something about it. Whether it's conscious or unconscious, they lie to keep people off their back so that they continue using, whether it's a drug, it's pornography, it's sex. And a part of this is lying. So lying is one of the ways that an addict preserves their addiction. So I'm going to put kind of a bold statement out there, and that is, if somebody is gaslighting you, there is some form of lying that's part of that. There is some part of that where the addict isn't truly facing their addiction. The second reason is they want to avoid facing reality. So the addict reorganizes their world and in a different way. Remember, they're no longer connected to prefrontal cortex when you're in addiction. Instead, you're working out of that limbic part of your brain. So part of recovery is we've got to rewire our brain and strengthen the connection to that executive function part of the brain. So um, they don't recognize themselves. Oftentimes the addict doesn't know who they are. And so if I gaslight and I present myself as somebody better than I am, then I don't have as much shame. I don't start to question my worth and my value. And oftentimes the addicts will live in an alternate reality and they believe, they believe what they're, they're thinking, they believe what they're saying. And gaslighting is a part of that. They will believe that porn and sex aren't a problem. Um, the third reason is to avoid confrontation. I see this one quite a bit. With betrayal and the consequences to the attachment between the addict partner and the betrayed partner, there's gonna be interpersonal conflict. And that can be very overwhelming for the addict because the addict doesn't know how to manage, deal, recognize, process emotions. And so sometimes an addict will say and do whatever they need to say or do in order just to get their loved ones to back off. Um, they don't want to see disappointment in the betrayed partner's eyes. They don't want to see them get angry and hear those you know, hurtful words. They don't like the tone of the voice. And so oftentimes they will say what they need to say so that they can avoid some kind of a conflict. Um, so another thing that might happen is that they may become increasingly defensive the more that a betrayed partner pushes. And so we have another dynamic there where all of a sudden the betrayed partner is going to all of a sudden really focus on whatever they can do to calm and soothe the addict partner, or they're going to disconnect completely. So be aware of that dynamic. Dynamic Number four, they're in denial. So even though there's overwhelming evidence to the contrary, the denial compels the addict to disavow their problems and to ignore the consequences of their behavior. We talked about denial in a few, probably earlier this year, I did a webinar on denial. So we really talked about how denial functions and how it helps the addict, but it's a very valuable protective function. It's, I call it gaslighting's best friend, because if I can stay in denial, then my gaslighting serves me. I don't have to acknowledge it, recognize it, do anything about it, as I say. Okay, hey, number five. Um, the addict believes they're different. So if they acknowledge that they have a problem, but they want to continue using it, they might somehow figure out how they are the exception to the rule. So a lot of their gaslighting might be, you know, I can stop at any time, or, you know, it's been 10 years between the last time I acted out and this time when you caught me. So they believe that somehow they're not like other addicts. I will hear men that come away from men's groups saying, you know, my problem isn't nearly as bad as so-and-so's. You should be grateful that you're in relationship with me or married to me because mine's not nearly that bad. Um, the other, the problem is though that <clears throat> the addict really 
doesn't live within the normal bounds of recovery behavior. So they're truly not in recovery. Uh, we talked about shame. That's number six. They feel ashamed. So there's extreme shame and embarrassment and regret. So the addict's going to paint a picture of themselves to others that is far more flattering than reality. So I'm going to use some communication tools. I'm going to do some behaviors that will help me minimize my shame so I don't have to experience in the moment with you. There is a lot of shame that the addict partner feels because of the pain and the hurt that they've caused the betrayed partner. And so shame comes up very easily. The last reason is, is because they've done it for years and they can. So sometimes we have addicts that learn how to gaslight early in life. And sometimes we have addicts who have been in their addiction for years and they've gaslit and they've got away with it. Sometimes there've been family and friends who have actually kind of minimized the gaslighting, even rationalized it away, um, tried to be understanding and loving. So sometimes they even turn a blind eye to some of the, the behaviors that are worrisome. And <clears throat> this sends a message to the addict that, hey, you know, this gaslighting works. I'm gonna keep using this. And again, this can be on a very unconscious level. Okay, so the next thing I wanna share, and that is that gaslighting has a style. And I think that this is such a great way to measure, you know, if you're dealing with a gaslighter and how they approach you. So the first style we're gonna talk about is the intimidator. So as you can imagine, this gaslighter is more like a bully. So they're more aggressive, they're more controlling, they wanna dominate, they wanna control conversations, or they can even go to the other end of that and they do the silent treatment. What they're doing also is at times threatening to take safety away from the betrayed partner. So it might be finances, it could be children, it could be family, I've seen that happen as well. But they use that power that I talked about earlier to really intimidate the betrayed partner. So I kind of call this style the bully because it's all about putting up a fight. The second type is what I call the good guy. This is the guy that I see show up in groups and he is such an awesome group member. He does his work. Everybody sees how happy he is to be there and he's friendly with everybody. But then when he goes home and he's with the betrayed partner, his personality suddenly changes and they start gaslighting. I call this style Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So the betrayed partner is really hurt because they're observing the addict partner treating other people so kindly and nicely and acting so well when they go to group. And then behind closed doors, there's a totally different reality. I have partners come in that I'm working with and oftentimes they will say to me, I just need some people to believe that this is happening because what they see is just this really nice guy. I keep hearing what a nice guy he is, but that's not necessarily the case when you're dealing with somebody who's doing gaslighting. And then the last one is we're going to call this the glamour gaslighting. So the glamour gaslighter is they start out being real gentlemen. It might even be the addict that says, yes, I am so sorry, I've done everything wrong. I'm gonna do everything I can to make this up to you. And they do in the beginning. They will be kind and loving. They're almost like, in many cases, the ideal addict in recovery. However, at some point it shifts and changes and they start to become more furious at their significant other, their, their betrayed partner. So the betrayed partner all of a sudden has no idea what's gone wrong or what they've done wrong. So they're very confused. So you'll often see the betrayed partner try to make things better by pleasing the addict partner, by, I call it the please and appease type of behavior to try to get that really gentlemanly, you know, addict to come back and to work with them on getting recovery going. So we see that there are some common gaslighting behaviors. There are so many. 
we're only going to talk about a few in the time that we have. And I'm going to give you examples of what you might hear. So if you are the addict partner, I want you to really assess some of the things that I say and ask yourself, do I do these behaviors? Do I say these words? You know, have I ever done this? Um, do I need to go back and take accountability for it? For the betrayed partner, this is a good measuring tool to see if you are experiencing gaslighting. The big one I see is the shifting blame. So we also refer to that as DARVO, which is an acronym for deny, attack, and then we reverse the victim and the offender. So all of a sudden now, it's the person who's actually hurting the other person who turns it back around and now they're the victim. And it's very, very confusing. And it happens so quickly that oftentimes the betrayed partner doesn't even know what happened. So you might hear things like, um, well, it's your fault that it happened. You know, I wouldn't have talked to you like that if you hadn't done this, this, and this. You know, you're not perfect either. You did this, this, and this. You know, and this is how you treat me after everything I've done. Of all the recovery work I've done, I'm being so good. And you're going to criticize me about that. And then they begin to focus on the betrayed partner's behaviors. So be aware of the addict partner. Are they blaming or are they taking accountability? If they're shifting the blame, then just know that there's gaslighting going on. The next one is minimizing. I see this show up and it will take form in a variety of different ways. A passive aggressive way is that um, the addict partner might say something that's borderline cruel and then they'll turn around and say, you know, it's just a joke. Can't you take a joke? Or you know, they will, um, when a partner comes to them and says, I'm really dealing with this, this, and this, you know, they minimize it by saying, well, you know what, you know, it's getting better or, you know, that's not that big of a deal. I'm dealing with the same thing. And so they're really minimizing the betrayed partner's experience rather than validating and coming in with empathy. So if you get defensive right away and start to tell the betrayed partner, that life, the situation, your addiction is not as bad as they think it is, then know that you're minimizing. The next one is withholding. So this is not providing the betrayed partner with the connection they need. It could be the information they need. It could be the safety that they need. And so what we'll see is things like the addict partner saying things like, I'm not doing check-ins with you anymore because you get mad at me. Or it might be, um, my, my therapist says that I don't have to share with you. Or, you know, don't blame me. You know, I never meant to hurt you. Or they're going to do the silent treatment. So they step away. So even the silent treatment is a form of gaslighting, even though words are not spoken. So if you're an addict partner, and one of the behaviors you do is you pull away from your betrayed partner because somehow you were triggered and you're maybe in your denial and your shame and you want to turn around and distance yourself from them, then know that that's what you're doing. You're withholding, okay? The other one is countering. countering. I call this the tit for tat, right? It's when the uh, betrayed partner comes to the addict partner and they have an issue um, they might even confront the um, addict partner with events that took place. And what they then have is somebody who kind of comes back at them. They counteract. So they come back with their denial. Very, very defensive. Um, even with countering, they might even say things like, you know, you have a bad memory. That's not what happened. You know, it happened like this. Or you never remember things accurately. Or that didn't happen. I never said that. I never did that. And it's very, very triggering for the betrayed partner. So be aware of the behaviors that you go into where you're denying events that took place. Here's what I have found. I have found that betrayed partners have really good memories. They really do. They can remember conversations because remember, they're connected to the prefrontal cortex. 
they're in their executive functioning part of their brain. And the addict is in that limbic part. So they remember very accurately. So if you're constantly denying your betrayed partner's truth, then know that you're countering. Another one is diverting and discrediting. So they make the betrayed partner appear as if they're emotionally unstable. You know, it might be things like, you know what, everybody in my group thinks you're crazy. Or my therapist says that you are in recovery and I am. Or, you know, you're just being paranoid. I'm not doing that. And oftentimes they will just go, you know what? You're more at fault than I am. So anytime you put the betrayed partner down, the addict partner needs to recognize that they are discrediting or they are diverting the attention from them and their recovery and turning it back around on the partner. Okay. The next one is deflection and distraction. Love this one. Shows up as changing the subject or distracting the victim. So I see this as the addict partner telling a joke when it's inappropriate. So you've had the betrayed partner share with you something very vulnerable and they're coming to you for connection and you make a joke or you don't even acknowledge what they said. You change the topic and you talk about something else or you respond with a question rather than answering. So you might say things like, you know, why would you even ask me that? Tell me, why do you need to know that? You know, my, my therapist says, you don't need to tell, I don't need to tell you that. Or they might say, you know, you do the same thing and now you're getting upset about it. So now I'm kind of pushing it back on you. So I'm deflecting so I don't have to talk about it, take accountability and address the issue. Another one is I see them using stereotypes. So very negatively, negative labels the addict partner will put on the betrayed partner. So they'll say things like, you know, you're just being hysterical. You're an irrational woman. You know, you're like all those other betrayed partners. You're, you'll never forgive. You know, all of the other women in your group, you know, all they care about is, you know, um, making sure that everybody knows how bad we are as addicts. Recognize if you're stereotyping your betrayed partner in a certain group. That can even also be um, expanded upon, and it could be even cultural groups. It could be religious groups. It could be sexual orientation groups. So recognize that we can also stereotype a variety of different people. Um, the next one is using loving words as weapons. So you might do something really cruel as the addict partner and then say, you know, I love you, or I would never hurt you on purpose. So that gets very, very confusing. So be aware of whether or not you use affection to manipulate the betrayed partner out of their difficult, heavy, strong emotions. They need to be validated. They need to be recognized. And you need to do your best at trying to understand where they're coming from. And then the last one is rewriting history. They always retell their stories in their favor. I see this ha happen so many times when I have actually staffed with another therapist. So I might be seeing the betrayed partner, they're seeing the addict partner. We've been given permission to visit with each other by the clients. And all of a sudden we share our stories. Here's the information I'm getting and they don't match up. And oftentimes I've had the addict partner's therapist then go back in and ask and sure enough, there were some details that were left out. That is a way of rewriting history. If I don't share everything, if I don't make it sound as bad as it is. Another way I can do that is that by just saying to my partner, that's not what I said. I never said that. You're making that up. Or sometimes even just creating a whole story that you repeat back to them that they don't even recognize. So again, the addict partner is going to retell their stories in a way that works for them and in their favor. So be aware of the stories if you're an addict partner that you're telling. You know, you need to check in and you need to see how truthful and honest you're being. So let's talk briefly about how we stop the gaslighting. This is very, very simple. So for the addict partners, I'm going to give you just a few points. It takes work. So first of all, if you are a liar, know that you are a gaslighter. 
So you have to admit that you have a problem. So you got to be honest with yourself. So check in and see, am I denying my recovery? Do I cover it up? Do I blame my partner? Do I, do I distance myself? Some of those things that I just talked about, you've got to be open and real about. Learn about gaslighting, just like I talked about today. Identify your style. Identify the reasons you do it. And then how it shows up. Recognize what you say and what you do. So this is going to take maybe some journaling. Another way to do that is by going in and um, being accountable to somebody. So you could talk to a friend. You could go in with your therapist and say, hey, I've got an issue with lying. I know that I'm gaslighting and I need to figure out why I do it. What is the reason behind this? Why can't I show up authentically and honestly and openly instead of defensively and with my shame taking control? Okay. I like that idea of being accountable to someone. So have a friend that you can talk to and check in with. Commit to being completely truthful to them. You've got to practice that because there are a lot of addicts that will lie for no reason at all because it's a bad habit in other aspects of their lives. And that right there will trigger a betrayed partner so quickly. Just a tiny little white lie. Okay. Consider the consequences. Really check in. And then you're journaling. I want you to look at, okay, if I admit my lies, right, and my lies are exposed, what's going to happen? What are the consequences? How do I need to take accountability? So it might be that to completely get out of your lies, you are willing to do a therapeutic formal disclosure where you share the complete and honest truth. And then you get to stay in that relationship and help your partner heal. So the consequences you've got to consider, if I keep lying, I may not be in recovery or I can stop lying. I can deal with what I need to deal with and I can get to a better place. I can commit to positive change so that I have a second chance to repair this broken trust with my partner and get to a better place in life, a place that I've never been before, because I do hear couples say that and recovering addicts say that. Um, set goals. So make sure you set positive goals. Um, remember, there's a lot of shame with the addict partner. So maybe give yourself a goal that for one day, I'm going to be completely honest with everybody. And then figure out how to be completely honest with everybody. A lot of people will say to me, you know, if I told them really how I felt, I'm, I'm afraid that it would just feel so mean. Well, we can say hard things and still sound like a kind person. So if you're struggling with that, then check in with somebody and get some help with that. So really commit yourself to recovery. You can even ask your betrayed partner, if you notice I'm doing this, this, or this, will you please let me know? so that I can stop doing it. That's another great way to set a positive goal in recovery. So what does the betrayed partner do? First of all, you've got to identify the reality of your situation. Remember I talked about the slow boil. So we've got to step back, we've got to check in and go, okay, how am I feeling when I'm in relationship with my partner? Is my intuition telling me something? And they're giving me an answer that's completely the opposite. So it's really important that you step back and be what I call the compassionate observer. So step out of judgment of yourself, even judgment of the addict partner, and just notice what's happening. I tell my clients, look for patterns, connect the dots, right? We're going to try to just look at the facts and the data and notice what's going on. Journaling is a great way to keep track of that. So maybe you are hearing the same comment every time from your addict partner and it's shutting you down. Then journal that. Journal the interactions that you leave there feeling crazy. Then go and check in with a trusted friend, somebody who understands the recovery work you're doing. Going to your therapist and identifying it with your therapist. I had somebody come in just recently and they came in one week and they just could see the gaslighting. They were so clear on it. They knew the behaviors. They could identify it. Two weeks later, they come in 
and they tell me about some behavior that the addict is doing and they've kind of shifted the type of gaslighting and the partner's falling for it and they don't even recognize it's gaslighting. So go to a therapist that really understands that type of behavior and how you can handle it when you recognize it. Um, the other thing I would that would be helpful is to always, like I say to my clients, go internal, check and see what's happening on the inside when you're interacting with this person. What are the behaviors I'm going into? What are the feelings I have internally? Because when we're gaslit, we can feel it oftentimes, okay? Expect that in early recovery, the addicts will lie. So don't look the other way. Just take the information. Let the addict partner know what you see. If it's not what they're telling you, be very honest. And you've got to put boundaries in place around lying. And then the hardest part of that is you've got to follow through because the addict has to have consequences for their actions of lying. And sometimes those are hard boundaries. And this is the time I have betrayed partners come in and we work in session on boundaries and then how to hold to the consequences. So seek help on that. Um, step out of some of the safety seeking behaviors that um, take place when gaslighting's experienced. So stop trying to take control of helping the addict recover, of trying to rescue them somehow, um, just step out of that and just let them work on their own recovery. Do not be their accountability partner. Instead, have the addict partner get a sponsor, have them get somebody who they're accountable to in their groups that when they're struggling, then they turn to them. Because what I find out often that happens is if the accountability partner is the betrayed partner, then the addict partner will rationalize sharing a slip or a struggle with them because they don't want to trigger them or activate them. They don't want to disappoint them. And so they hold on to that information and they don't share it. And so when the partner's sensing something is off, they come to the addict partner and say, hey, what's going on? You kind of seem different. And they say, no, I'm fine. You're back and you're lying again. So it's really, really important that you have somebody else who's your accountability partner and ask them, what do I need to do so I don't lie? How can I do this in a healthier way? The other thing is to create a supportive environment that facilitates honesty rather than engaging in a power struggle. So this is a hard one. With the betrayed partner, you've got to get to that place where you've got that emotional regulation, where you can sit in a hard conversation and that's hard in the early days. So we talk about the timeout. And I've mentioned that numerous times here, that if you go internal and you notice I'm starting to get triggered, that you take the timeout and go do self-care. And then whoever calls the timeout, we come back together within 24 hours. We can come back sooner, but we have to allow our brains time to get back online. That means connected to prefrontal cortex. Another technique I teach the, um, the betrayed partners is when you're having to talk about something really hard, go low and slow. What I mean by that is lower the tone of your voice and talk a little slower and have there be more pauses, right? You might even bring some notes, bullet points to the talk. You might even take notes. And oftentimes I really like if you need a moment to think about what they're saying, step away, say to the addict partner, you know, this is going to go bad. I need to step away and figure out what's going on and what I need. And then use that four-part talking boundary that we talk about again and again and again, which is sharing the data. Then you're going to share the stories you're in, the emotions it's bringing up for you, and what you need. It's a great way to come back in a very grounded way. Um, encourage the addict partner to be involved in support groups. Sometimes it's a, it's a sacrifice for the betrayed partner to have the addict partner going to groups, especially if they're going to numerous 12-step groups during the week, maybe they're going to a recovery group. It can be very, very difficult, but really encourage them rather than discouraging them. I know I've had betrayed partners in groups say to me, you know what, we didn't come to group because I talked him into going to dinner. So we went to dinner instead of coming to group. So that's what I mean, really support them in their recovery work. And then, of course, focus on your own recovery. 
which is, is that emotional regulation, creating that stability. That means you've got to really focus on yourself. At some point, got to take the attention off the addict partner. You've got to learn the boundaries, how to set them, what they should be, how to follow through. You've got to educate yourself, not only about gaslighting, but about all the aspects of recovery from betrayal trauma and even recovery for the addict. Really focus on self-care. I know when I have a partner who is struggling, I always go to, are you doing your self-care? Because when they're struggling, typically they're not. And then if you don't have a therapist and you're not seeing somebody, consider getting in to see somebody who's qualified, who understands this, so you can have somebody assist you in learning about it and how to get out of it. Because sometimes we don't have the ability because we have such high emotions to figure out how to put together some type of strategies and how to manage those situations in the moment. So anyway, those are some thoughts on gaslighting. Next time, we are going to talk about how the betrayed partners gaslight themselves mm -hmm. because betrayed partners also gaslight. Lots of great stuff. And we've got some questions, but I was thinking the lies of omission as well as commission, because, you know, it's like, well, I didn't lie, but I just didn't tell the truth, you know, like that's lying. Like, but we parse it out. I was also thinking, you know, when you were talking about, um, uh, the comparing, I'm not as bad as, and I was like, why do we addicts never go, but we're not as good as, and I don't like using good and bad, but, but it's always like, oh, I'm not that bad. You know, it is why we started, um, because we can always find why we're different, you know, but if we're looking for where we connect on, you know, like, oh, I, you know, I felt shame. I felt guilt. I felt, you know, I've done these things. I've lied, you know, all of those, that's where we connect. It's not what we did. And really, this gaslighting happens across every form of addiction. I know we're talking you know, you know, most importantly about, you know, in uh, in sex addiction, porn addiction, infidelity, th those type of things. But gaslighting happens, you know, every form of addiction, you know, so this is this is prevalent. So, um, you know, and, and I do think it's really easy for partners to, you know, to make excuses, you know, like, oh, you know, his attachment style, you know, it, like it brings up shame for him if we start to talk about these things. And I was like, and it shuts you down. Like you don't, you know, to me, that is a form of gaslighting because, oh, you know, oh, and so, you, sh you know, they, they just completely shut down. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, there was something else I was going to quick. To, I, you know, I loved all the different, you know, the, the glamour gaslighter. I was like, well, that's a different one. You know, that one, was, that one's a little different, you know, but I hear so often, like, just like you said, you know, you know, he's a bully or whatever, or the, oh, he looks like, you know, everybody thinks he's a great guy. And then he comes home, you know, and, you know, and so feeling like, A, I'm crazy, but also nobody believes me because all they see is the great guy and how compartmentalized that is and how unfair, you know, that is, you know, as well. So, so great stuff. I'm going to, um, we're going to go to questions so we don't miss out on any. My husband uh, has been in denial for eight months. D-Day was eight months ago. Husband doesn't talk to me at all concerning his last porn addiction. Admits no wrongdoing. If he is filled with shame, then why wouldn't he get rid of the shame and get help? And even lies when I tell him that I have proof and he twists my words to mean something is that normal it, it, to not even be able to communicate just talking in general? Yes. Yes, especially when he's still in denial and he hasn't broken yeah. through. And he's just completely immersed in his shame. So the interesting thing with shame is Yes, he's got shame around the porn addiction or whatever his addiction behaviors are, the lust and the porn addiction, but it spills over into every aspect of an addict's life because the lenses with which they view themselves is that they are broken, I'm not good enough. And so as a partner, I might just go to have a simple conversation or even share a frustration with the addict partner and all of a sudden they just get defensive and they start gaslighting because their shame is so great. It's unfortunate that you don't have somebody that's there to help you. Um, I think for you though, focus on yourself. Yes, he's doing all of that, but how are you managing and how are you dealing with his shame? Because oftentimes 
when an addict partner projects their shame out onto the betrayed partner, they go into their shame. They feel like they're not good enough. And also I see betrayed partners come in and when their addict partner is not willing to do recovery, they feel like it's because they're doing something wrong or because they're not good enough. So that's another thing for you to check in and see, am I doing that? Go to a therapist. Maybe the therapist can help you do your self-care and continue maybe to document what you're seeing so that you can put the truth down. And if the day comes where he's willing to finally look at the truth, you can see, you know, what you dealt with. You can share that with him, hopefully at some point, but you're right. If somebody's in shame, if they're in their addiction and they're also in denial, they are going to twist your words and they will take the most innocent things that you say and somehow flip it around and make it, you know, like you were so cruel and you were so abusive and that's so unfortunate. So I hope that you've got somebody that's there to support you because your situation would be very, very difficult. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here. Um, uh, and, but yeah, I was thinking healthy boundaries for you. What do you need to do to take care of you? Because, you know, he, he clearly is in a, you know, in a really horrible place, you know. And, and you know, you asked, um, why would he not want to get out of shame? He's got no tools to get out of shame, unfortunately, in, especially in early addiction. And especially if we're not working on getting help, you know, we stay in that space. And it's, I think it's the worst place to be of not acting out, which is our go to, um, to, you know, we can numb out, escape all of those things. So if we're not acting out and we don't have tools to use, we are in the worst possible place. So, you know, um, in, in, in alcohol abuse and stuff, we talk about dry drunk and that's what it is. It's like, I'm, 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 I still have all of the nasty characteristics of my acting out. I haven't learned to be different. And I'm also trying not to, you know, I'm trying to white knuckle it and not act out. Um, but, but I've heard so many doozies of stories of like, you know, like I've been caught and, you know, one of them was, um, uh, it was about drinking. Uh, it was co-occurring sex addiction too, but you know, he came home and, um, he, he ran over the landscaping. He ran over the bushes and she pointed out you're, you're parked over the landscaping. Well, that's where I always park, you know, cause she was like, you know, you've been drinking and he was like, no, this is where I always park. And I was like, you always park over the top of your landscaping. And I know he was trying to make her believe it. It's like the insanity of all of that. Fortunately, she didn't buy that one, but you like, it's really challenging when somebody is, you know, picking away at you forever and telling you, yeah, I always park, you know, over the tops of the landscaping, you know, it's challenging. I know that's a ludicrous one and it really was, but, the, but it's more insidious than that on many levels. So healthy boundaries for you. Yeah, let me circle back around because I had another idea. And that is, you know, sometimes when I've got clients that are dealing with this, I tell them when you go to communicate, keep it really simple. You know, I don't know if you text, I prefer in person talking, but you want to keep it to two to three sentences at a time. So maybe in your case, if he's not willing to talk about hard things, present what it is you need him to think about and come back later. We don't have to do it all at the same time. And then keep it really simple because that way your words don't get as twisted. So that's a technique that we use sometimes. Yeah. Well, and I'm really sorry because like, it, you know, if it's just a general conversation, that doesn't feel like a partnership or, or a relationship, you know, where, you know, where, so, so Dr. Stan Tatkin did a podcast with Dr. Rob. He did another series that will be posted soon, but it's called We Do in a healthy relationship, we against the world in an unhealthy relationship. You know, it's me, 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 me addict, you know, versus the two of us together. So, so, you know, that may be useful. I think sometimes just listening to that, the two of you and going, you know, this is, this is what I vision. Is that what you want too? And if they do, then what do we need to do to get there? And if it's like, yeah, no, I'm fine with what I, you know, what we're doing, that's really good information for you to be able to make a decision of, you know, how, how do you, and you can stay in the relationship. Lots of people do even with, you know, active addiction, but they find their tribe, they find their people that support them, you know, so that, you know, what he's doing or not doing, you know, has less impact. It doesn't have no impact, but has less impact. 
Okay, Debbie, the next one is part of betrayal partners healing, teasing through pre-discovery, the toxic behaviors that I as a betrayed partner felt responsible for when I didn't know about his addiction. I have felt that like I was the problem in our relationship and I know I have issues to deal with, but there were certainly times when it was my addict partner who created disharmony so he could have the opportunity to act out. How much time should a betrayed partner spend on that kind of work with a therapist? Acceptance that I am not responsible for so much that I didn't know was even happening. I think that it's really important to tease through that. And that should be a part of the formal therapeutic disclosure because you're right. That's part of the addict taking accountability for their behaviors. Because again, if they're acting out and it's pre-discovery, they are manipulating you and you're reacting to the distress that's taking place. And it's really helpful if the addict partner can even give examples of when they did it. And oftentimes I've even had betrayed partners as part of their questions ask, you know, on this Christmas when we had that great big fight and you told me that I was the one who started it, were you acting out that day? And a lot of the, most of the addicts will go, yeah, I was, I, I was in my addiction. I was doing it. I was not, you know, sober. I was not in recovery. And so I do believe that that's a really important part. The accountability is so crucial for the addict partner because it's going to make them show up authentically and honestly with vulnerability. They've got to push aside the shame. And so it's so important that they do that because that's where I think we can start to rebuild trust and honesty. So even if it is the pre you know, early days, I think that's a part of it, especially if it's had a negative impact on you as the betrayed partner. But, but understanding that I am not responsible, you know, nothing you did or didn't do caused this, nothing you do or don't do, you know, will stop him. And you are so right when you talk about, um, the addict will do something, will pick a fight, will, will, they will do something to instigate something to justify, oh, see, you know, like, I'm just going to leave. And they already have, and it's not even conscious. A lot of times it's just in, the, you know, but this is a pattern. And so, so it's very complex, but please do, yeah, do the work so that you understand. Yep. You know, all of those things, it wasn't me, you know, I, you know, we're people and we, it's complicated, but for the addiction, it really is, you know, um, I'm going to act out regardless of what happens and I'm going to create a situation so that it, I'm justified in doing it, you know, like the lies we tell ourselves. You know, I, this makes me think of a disclosure I did one time, a therapeutic disclosure. And um, there was a lot of questions on pre-discovery stuff because she, the, the betrayed partner could not understand why certain things took place. And so that was addressed in the therapeutic disclosure. And it was so interesting that when she asked, you know, her partner, you know, when this, when you did this and we had this happen and it was so bad, were you in your addiction? And of course he said, yes, I was, here's what I was doing. And I visually saw that betrayed partner go, oh, right. It was like, yes, I was right. And I tell my betrayed partners over and over and over again, that if your intuition is telling you that there's something there, believe your intuition, document it, write it down so you don't forget it and believe your intuition. So sit in that and just kind of reflect on where there's certain things pre-discovery that you feel like, gosh, there's some, there's some wounding around that, right? Some relationship wounding. And, and maybe that can be included in some of the questions you ask. Okay. My SA partner repeatedly violates simple boundaries related and unrelated to SA. Example, I have a boundary that I want to know who comes to our home. Last Friday, we had plans to get some stuff done around the house, but he invited two friends over. He told me, uh, told them the other was coming um, even not me. I was blindsided and these situations make me look unreasonable. <laughs> he claims he forgot to tell me, which could be true, but not as often as it happens. It feels like he's causing unnecessary fights, but blames me. What, why does he do this? And how do I set and hold a boundary around this type of behavior? 
That's a that's a complicated question, but a great one. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, I'm going to tell you that one of the hardest things to deal with is passive aggressive behavior like that. And, oh, I forgot, or, oh, I thought I told you. And it does make, you know, you crazy. Um, I think with that, you're just going to have to, again, be very logical when you approach your partner. And I think that I would probably do a check-in. That's what I would do. If you've got things like that coming up, I think I would, in the early days, we're trying to create accountability, you know, ask your addict partner if they're willing to sit down and do a check-in and let's talk about, hey, this week, what's coming up or you're having, you know, who's had coming over, make them accountable at a check-in, maybe even write it down. And um, so that it's in writing. Sometimes we have to do that when we're trying to work through some harder things. But, you know, that I don't think it's unreasonable um, for him to have to ask, you know, before people come over to the house, especially, you know, as you're healing, you're from your betrayal. Um, and to feel blindsided like that does not create the safety that you need. And even when you set a boundary, if they violate the boundary, gosh, that's so hard. They're not rebuilding trust. In fact, they're creating more damage even by those little things. Um, a boundary like this, um, I'm not sure what boundary you have in place, but remember boundaries are about safety and it doesn't sound like he's very safe because he does this and then he doesn't tell you a complete truth. So maybe you need to step away, you know, from interacting with him for a bit, go do some self-care, go be with friends, you know, and take care of you so you can get grounded because I imagine that you can get really, really dysregulated when something like this happens. Um, continue setting boundaries, keep going back in, you know, if it doesn't work, check in with, you know, that trusted friend, that group member, that therapist and get some feedback input and go back and do it again. Right. Until you can figure out, well, you know, what's going to work for you. You do need support because if you're doing this alone, that is going to be so hard. Yeah. And I, I don't know what the communicated you know, you know, it, I want to know if you are unable to hold that boundary, then the consequence is, like Debbie said, I'm going to do self care, you're going to sleep in the other room. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the consequence that you've, you know, said it and it's not punitive, you did this. It's like, I'm, I'm taking care of me. And I am, like she said, dysregulated, I am upset, I was blindsided, I'm, I'm off kilter. So I'm going to need to take care of me and I'm going to need the space to do it. So you're going to sleep in, you know, in the other bedroom or whatever, whatever you have set in place but i'm kind of wondering if you know what the the it, it is passive aggressive but so i'm wondering if what the end result of that is doesn't feel like it's working so you need to shift you know how i'm taking care of myself a little bit so that you get the safety and hopefully he gets the message not guaranteeing it but well and um, another really quick idea and that is um, if you're in couples therapy, this would be a great area to address it and maybe even have your addict partner work on a safety plan. What's he going to do to create safety for you and, and ask him to include that, make that one of your needs. Okay. The next one, what a wonderful session. Thank you. Don't you think she does a great job? Yay. Um, like I said, <laughs> lots of great content. Um, I refer, I point people to her content often, you know, on our website. So this one will be posted either today or no later than tomorrow. I, I will beg Scott to get it up. Okay. Th there is addiction and thus gaslighting all throughout my family, but there is also mental illness like bipolar, which can cause delusions and persecution, paranoia. Any ideas on how I best support family members that seem to be in a combination of valid betrayal trauma, but also bipolar hypomania that is actually clouding their judgment perception as well. It's such a tricky line to manage validating the real abuse versus identifying when mental illness is causing adding to the issues. You know, that's a great question, man. We could some, spend a whole session on that one. Um, the first thought I had was instead of validating the story, validate the emotions, mm -hmm. validate with empathy, tune into that, ask them, you know, check in, see if they can identify what they're experiencing. I know they're probably flooded with other things. They could be, you know, hyper, they could be hypo aroused. You know, you kind of just kind of have to adapt to whether they're shut down or they're revved up. But 
really, I would, I would focus more on the emotion that that experience created in them and the effect it's having on them in the moment. And then ask them things like, you know, what do you, you, you know, do you have a plan for this? What kind of support can I give you? And maybe talk through for them what you can do rather than staying stuck in the stories. Because sometimes when, especially when we have like that, you said the delusions and different things like that, you know, we truly believe our stories. I mean, I make up some great stories myself and I believe my stories are true. But I think for you to get out of the cycle of you're stuck in the stories, I would assume, um, go for more of the empathy, the emotions, and and see what you can do to support them in that area. Great suggestion. Last question, Debbie. In 11 years, we've had one fight, and that was two months ago, over lust and porn. He was tired of me asking him questions. He just agrees and does what he wants. Any advice on the, that? Um, <laughs> wow. Again, passive aggressive, you know, a lot of people don't realize that passive aggressive behavior is done by people who have all the control. So he has all the control in this situation. So again, for you, I'm not sure I've got, there's so many answers I could give you on this one. Um, first of all, go seek support for yourself because it's really unfortunate that even though you're asking him you know, for something, I want information from you. I want to feel safe with you. I want to be able to move towards you. Please provide this for me. He's not recognizing just how important that information is. And instead he's ignoring you. Um, so get the support you need. Another thing is, is he willing to go to couples? You know, where are you guys at on that? Is he open to that where we can discuss this dynamic, this pattern in the relationship? And um, maybe address the passive aggressive behavior, but it's, that's really unfortunate. Um, you know, he's telling you, he agrees with what you say, and then he goes and does what he's, he wants. I bet that's been an issue throughout his life. That's a pattern he has that you're experiencing, you know, on a repeated basis. So, yeah. And I was thinking that this, but yeah, to have like him so shut down, you know, with, yeah, um, you talk and I'm just going to go do what I want. So somebody commented, thank you so much, Debbie. What a wonderful suggestion. Um, you ladies are such life savers. Thank you for this work. Thank you guys for being here and asking great questions and staying in the, you know, in the midst of all of this. This is tough stuff. And so, um, so come back. Um, Matt Wheeler will be on next week and then Debbie will be here in two weeks. Uh, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. So thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.